producer and Loki himself, Tom Hiddleston. We have director Kate Heron, co-executive producer Kevin Wright, and head writer Michael Waldron. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. What an amazing... You kind of summed up the whole show for us there, Eric. We don't yeah. Need yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, let's jump in. The show is called Loki, so it only makes sense to begin with our original Loki, Tom Hiddleston. Tom, for you to return to the role of Loki for not just another two-hour movie, but this is a six-hour experience on Disney+. Plus. What was the most important thing to you that you wanted to see included in this series before making the decision to return? That is a great question. Um, I think I was just so excited to be allowed the opportunity to explore the character further. Loki contains multitudes. As you see in the show, it's kind of literally expressed. Um, but he, he is a character who has such breadth and range and for as long as I've been playing him in all my research and in all the different movies, um, these multitudinous contradictions and complexities have been the most fascinating aspect of, of the portrayal. And I wanted to retain all the work that had been done in, in the previous movies that I'd been in. Um, with all those collaborators, with Kenneth Branagh and Joss Whedon and Alan Taylor and Taika Waititi and Joe and Anthony Rousseau and Chris Hemsworth and Anthony Hopkins and all those extraordinary actors who, had, who I had been on the journey with. But build on that, break him open um, and, and go deeper and, and this greater exploration of, of who he is. And um, I, I mean, I, I had, as you see, I had the best um, collaborators and, and co-explorers in that endeavor. Um, and it was so, it was just so exciting and so fun. It felt like the possibilities were endless. Um, perhaps Michael can speak sometimes they were too endless and we needed to... <laughs> um, for, to for sure. Yeah, it was really about taking this character we love and, and building, building on him. Uh, and yeah. building on Loki, kind of adding, 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 exploring all those things. Yes, uh, which was a br brilliant part of the show. Uh, Kevin, let me back up a little bit because it must be a really fun time at Marvel right now, getting to introduce television storytelling into the mix. It's really opened up the MCU in so many exciting ways. Talk about how and when the idea to hatch this show about Loki was conceived. Um, wow. So I think, yes, I think right now we're, we're making more than ever, <laughs> which is, which is exciting. The thing that this really opened up for us was when Disney plus came along, suddenly we knew we wanted to make some shows. And I think it was pretty early on that Kevin Feige had identified, well, Loki's got to be one of those characters. And I think it was, that was the idea was, well, it's a Loki show. <laughs> what does that mean? Um, and I, I, and it, I think the reason it felt right was just because of everything Tom just said. It's like, it's such a deep character. And something that we identified early on between Michael and Kate and I was, um, he had only been, like, the screen time was something crazy. In, like, 10 years of movies at that point, it was maybe two hours and yeah. some change. And that he had that type of... Um, resonance with with audiences and that's obviously <laughs> has uh, everything to do with tom here but that like that it just felt like oh there is a deep well of of emotion and character to um explore with with, with this and and i think it's just it's a pleasure to actually have six hours to to do that and so it just felt right and um i think that's what we've all been learning in with Disney Plus and the streaming spaces, we can really live in these worlds, which, you know, lets us make a world like the TBA and get to really spend some time there. Yeah, without a doubt. It lets it breathe a little bit too. Uh, Michael, talk about how you got involved with Loki and, and what was maybe the thing that you saw or read or watched 
that was like an aha moment for you in terms of understanding what this show was going to be? Um, well, I mean, it, it, Kev, Kevin Wright, you know, he, he took, took a chance on me as a, as a producer <laughs> and, and really, you know, ch- championed me over there at Marvel and, and he deserves, you know, he, he and the producing team deserve so much of the credit for this thing because I was handed the gift of what if you had Loki in the world of the TVA and that in a lot of ways was the most important discovery of all because, because there is just, you know, for me as a writer, it was like, Holy crap. There's just endless possibilities with that. This chaotic character running up against, um, (laughs) <laughs> a organization that is pure order. Um, and so uh, that was how I got brought into the, brought into the fold. And, and from there it was, it was going back, you know, I knew, and I said this in my very first meeting that I felt like the ceiling for this show was, was best show anybody's ever seen that that, that should be our, our goal. And, and that was, that was because to me, I, I look, we, we have one of the best actors alive in, in Tom portraying a blockbuster movie villain that fans have a decade of investment in. And we're going to get to do six hours of exploration of that character. That was so thrilling. And I think maybe I, I always go back to the scene in Thor, the Dark World. Um, when Loki is told that his mother has died and he, and he takes it and it's, it's over music and he's quiet and he nods and Tom turns his back and just clenches his fists. And there's this explosion of telekinetic magic energy that throws the chairs across his prison cell. And I was like, that's it. That's the show that, that, that felt like the Sopranos to me, that felt like great television. Um, and and I think we were we were off to the races from there. For sure, Kate. I I have heard stories about you going in to pitch uh, on mm-hmm. this show. I know you're a Marvel fan, uh, and to begin with. And so I'm curious, what was that that pitch like? And and from your pitch, what were you able to actually execute in this series? Yeah. So. Uh, basically like I really wanted the job and I was aware that I was coming from a background in directing mainly comedy and like teen comedy and I was like okay I know I'm not the obvious choice so I just have to convince them like why I'm the best choice for it so yeah I I really went for it with the pitch I would say um (laughs) I went in with this kind of really long powerpoint presentation and I just tried to cover every aspect of it you know like when but I would say like the thing I was given that was a gift obviously is you know I got the script from Michael and I just was so excited by everything in the pages and then also just the idea of you know, taking the Loki that hasn't gone on that amazing arc that we'd seen in Marvel and actually a very different journey. So I thought that was really exciting. And to be honest, like the pitch ended up being like with the visuals and just so many of the ideas, like, I mean, like Gugu was in my pitch, we did, end, you know, who ended up being in the show, for example. And yeah, I think for me, it was really about being clear about my take on what they'd already built and then being like, you know, if you hire me as a director, this is kind of where I think we could push the story and, this is what I think could be really interesting to do with it. And yeah, and everyone else I think was like, yes, that, that's good. So I, I guess like quite a lot of it got in there. Um, yeah, <laughs> surprisingly. It, it's funny, Kate, because like you and Michael, I feel like had very different pitching processes on this where I feel like we really put Michael through the ringer of like, <laughs> I, what we, I, we, I, we had the easy job of what if Loki's at the TBA? And then for, I think it was weeks, Michael was off just toiling like, okay, so how can time travel work? <laughs> and trying to rework this over and over and over again. And I remember the first time that Steven and I like Skyped with you, we thought it was like, oh, this is going to be a, a general, like your, your agents had said you were interested. And it was like, shock and all like it was this wasn't even the formal pitch yet this was like you were just, i remember just dropping images into the yeah. skype and we were like <laughs> oh this person gets it <laughs> they're so on board but it was like just the, the dueling sides of that of uh 
I think because it all happened pretty quick with you, but I, I apologize, Michael. We put you through it those first. <laughs> I was like, I was like, writing, I was like writing like like scenes. I was like, so you think of time. It's like a parade, and it's like, and if somebody deviates from the parade, yeah, that's. I was rereading those like two nights ago. By the way, I was like kind of going back to see when this all started. It was almost like three years ago. Now. It's crazy, it's crazy. Some of, it, some of it ended up in there. Yeah. <laughs> And well, there is an aspect of sort of learning, uh, you know, not just about how this world works, but also more about Loki. Tom, I, I've heard that you took everyone to Loki school uh, <laughs> before this all started. And I'm just curious, like, what was that experience like teaching others about Loki's journey up until this point? And how did that help you maybe unlock something new about the character that maybe you hadn't realized up until this point? Well, yes, I, sh I feel I should first ex explain <laughs> why, how Loki came about. Um, uh, it, it, was a, it was a really interesting, as, I, as I'm, now everyone's aware, um, the, the show is so much about um, the multiplicity of identity and trying to integrate the disparate fragments of who we are into a whole that we might be able to understand and accept. And what Michael and Kate and Kevin did so well is in developing the series was you see that writ large, in, 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 you know, Loki comes face to face with variants of himself in many different capacities, some which look like him, some which don't, some which are older, younger. Um, even the alligator, you know, um, has, has a pair of horns. Um, but it became, I was aware of, of having conversations with the heads of every department from Autumn Durald, Akapur, our cinematographer, uh, Monique Ganderson, our stunt coordinator and fight director, um, Christine Wada, our costume designer, um, Kazra Farahani, our production designer, um, Douglas Snow and Amy Wood, hair and makeup, all, you know, every department was, was asking me questions about, um, so on the cape length, you know, the cape, on the cape, we've got this thing from, but the, how long does the cape go? And, and, or when, you know, when Loki fights the magic, you know, if, you, if he's making imaginary knives or real knives, what was the hand gesture? Or um, basically coming to me with questions that were specific to the work that they were doing because they were so precise and detailed. And I suddenly thought, having a conversation with Kate, Kim, I thought, should we just collect everybody in a room and I'll take them all? <laughs> um, to my great shame and embarrassment, um, I'm now known as Professor Loki and, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and Sophia DiMartino and Owen Wilson had their own version of, of Loki School. But it was a kind of, it became a... Um, I think a really interesting moment, which I couldn't have predicted, and I don't know about you guys, but it was something where Sophia said to me, she got a lot out of it in, in thinking about Sylvie, um, specifically in identifying what might be similar about Loki and Sylvie, but also very clearly in what was radically different um, and was going, and she had pride of authorship over, over Sylvie's characterization in opposition to Loki in one way. And with Owen, um, who I think was familiar with the character, but, but it not obviously hadn't um, had the same experience as I had, but was playing someone in Mobius who was an expert analyst in Loki. So he had to know Loki better, better than Loki did, knew himself. And so walking him through my journey and my research and all these things I picked up from Norse mythology and the comics. Um, and some of the questions he asked me were very insightful, which speaks to his enormous intelligence. But then he used those things in the scenes. He would, he would ad lib and improvise stuff um, and sort of say things that I had said to him as if that Mobius was saying to Loki. So yeah, it was a, um, a really interesting experience. It was it was terrifying. I don't think I'm making a very very good teacher. <laughs> and, uh, um, <laughs> I, I remember you when you there was one point where you actually explained the difference between illusion projection and 
and duplication or whatever. And it, and it, That's right. that just made its way into the script. You're like you said it. And I was like, hold on. Like that has to be, and then that's in the opening of episode two when Loki yeah. is correcting them in the armory because it's just that's so good uh, yeah. that explanation. Yeah. We, we should have raffled t- tickets. This, this was something the internet would yeah. just love to be, oh, yeah. be in the room for. <laughs> on the road, yeah. Yes. <laughs> on the road. Without a doubt, uh, uh, writing down Professor Loki as a variant idea for season two right now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, Kate, each episode has, it feels like it has its own visual language because we're bouncing between different time periods, but also moons and planets. You know, what was that process like uh, in terms of creating all of these different unique places to, that are visually stunning that we visit? Where do you start in creating an entirely new world for our characters? And maybe which location was your favorite sandbox to play in? Oh, okay, that's hard. I, I, I loved all the locations. I think, though, I'd say, like, the anchor for the show, right, is the TVA, because it's somewhere that we come back to, and I'd say, like, the visuals, like, even just in terms of the lighting, because I was really inspired in the scripts, you know, that the variant is attacking from the shadows, for example, and I was like, oh, let's, like, film noir, and, like, we could take some of that, and we kind of definitely brought that look, like, overall, like, across the whole show, in terms of how we were approaching our lighting, but... I think the thing that was important to all of us and like Kazra as well, like our production designer was just, yeah, we're going to go off well, for example, to Lamentus in episode three or the Citadel at the end of time, give them these kind of really stand out kind of visual looks that are so different. I think honestly, that was the real challenge because the TVA, we all as a team had such a clear idea of what that could look like, you know, the kind of like madmen and brutalist architecture feeling. So it was really then about, okay, when we're not there, let's like make sure these other places are equally as visually stunning and stand out. So, Michael, yeah. at, this, at the same time as you're building these worlds, you're also sort of designing the rules of this show. And I've seen like, sti- sti- I've seen still images of you like in front of this giant whiteboard, kind of looking like a Doc Brown from Back to the Future, sort of with circles and writing everywhere. You know, so you have a multiverse, you have a TVA, you have variants, alligator Lokis. How did you keep it all together in a way that it not just made sense to you, but also made sense to the entire cast and crew? Um, I don't know if I kept it together, but, uh, look, that's such a, everything that does make sense is such a testament to the entire team. My writing staff was incredible. And, and there was, we, we probably took the first two weeks of the writer's room and, and charted out the general emotional arc of the show And then we took another two, maybe even three weeks to essentially invent time travel um, is what it is, what it felt like. And and to uh, establish the rules of the TVA and and create an institutional uh, shared knowledge uh, that we could easily explain in the show and then hopefully never think about again. So the audience could get swept up in the adventure. and, And that was just, you know, our incredible team of writers working really hard. And then, you know, it was, it was everybody else, Kate coming on, at, you know, and as the person who had to interpret all this visually as a great storyteller herself being like, okay, here's what makes sense and what we can communicate and here's what's unnecessary and doesn't make sense. And, and then just all the great work of, the crew, you know, Kazra, the production design and everything. There's so much in the TVA that tells the story of, of that time travel, uh, the, the rules of all that. So yeah, I don't, I don't know how we did it, but I guess, I guess, I guess we pulled it off. You know, Kevin, say really I... quick, from <laughs> seeing from Michael, from you guys trying to figure out in the writer's room to then Kate, you working with like Casper and the VFX team to start like what the temp pads are going to show and all that. Yeah, yeah. It always, and I'm sure you guys have made this joke, but it always just turned into people going to a whiteboard or a notebook and drawing yeah. like lines <laughs> and like yeah. it just looked like spaghetti, like in a giant <laughs> knot. And universally people would go oh okay <laughs> like it was always yeah. that, like you could use as many words as you wanted to describe it and it yeah. ultimately just ended up being the universal language was these like hastily drawn lines on whiteboards 
It felt like in, you know, Hudsucker when he, so Hudsucker Proxy, when he draws the hula hoop and he's like the circle, but it was like that whenever you draw like the line on the board or whatever. So I remember, I think, I remember when Michael and Kevin, you first drew that when I obviously was coming in with fresh eyes and I was like, oh, I get it now. <laughs> like, it's like, yeah. So ridiculous to, to think about two lines that generally look the same and it's like, this one's wrong. Yeah. That's right. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, I, I get it. <laughs> and, or yes, I, I would, somebody would then go up, no, no, I think it's like this, and draw the same thing. Like, it would be the same, like, always. But from start to finish, it was like the language of how we figured this out, from script to VFX. <laughs> like... <laughs> Somebody drew a, drew a big circle and went, you know, for Disney Plus. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, Tom, the moment Loki uh, watches his own death uh, in, in Infinity War is not just, you know, a pivotal moment for the character, but it's a moment, for me at least, that opens up this entire series. What mm. was that moment like for you to discover first on the page and then on camera? I found it extremely exciting. It's so rare that the audience have so much more information than the character. And to play, to the idea of, um, just to take Loki out of it for a second, I think the conceit or the premise of any being being shown the end of their life um, and responding to it out, outside the boundaries of life was such an extraordinary opportunity as an actor. I can't think of other, very few other scenarios and stories where that happens. Um, and, and then for it to be Loki in particular, who across the first six movies of the MCU that I was in is, is propelled forward through, with a kind of self-defining entitlement and, um, and he's got such an engine of, uh, he feels like he has an engine which defines him and moves him through the world, his glorious purpose. Um, and not only was it, was it a character sort of, that the audience knew watching his own death, but it was, it was a character that the audience knew watching his own death, which I had portrayed myself. Yeah. Um, and, and so, it, my had my own memories of that day on the set of Infinity War and the generosity of, of the Russo brothers and of Josh Brolin as an actor and the difficulty we had in staging it and also the finality of it. We shot that scene and it was goodbye. Thank you, Tom. You know, come and see us anytime. <laughs> and, then, um, and then to be in a situation uh, with, with Kate um, where, where she and I really were, and Kevin were the only people that day who knew what was going on, I think. Um, and uh, because, they, because of the, what we all wanted for the time stage was technically going to be quite difficult to, to put in place um, on the set itself. So I was actually watching, um, I was just watching a war. I wasn't watching anything. In, in real terms. But of course I had the memory of the scene and, and Kate knew what the scene was and, and I felt very held um, by Kate in that moment. Um, and it's just, a, yeah, and it's an extraordinary opportunity. It's a very complex, I can't imagine the complexity of it. If any of us, if you, if you literally stop and think, what would it be like if somebody pulled you aside and pressed play on a piece of footage and you're watching the last day of your life and um, it wasn't what you expected. It's almost difficult to imagine the range of emotions that you would feel in a very profound and physical way, very immediate way. Um, and then the hollowness and the emptiness when Loki understands that his glorious purpose has been fraudulent and is without meaning. And then where does he go from there? We've got another five hours. That was what was so exciting. To, you know, to, to, to have a breakdown and to go, right, well, what, what do I do now? Um, you know, and Mobius offers him that, that olive branch. But I remember reading it for the first time and I remember we, Michael and I had breakfast the day after and I, I think I held him captive for 48 hours after that. <laughs> Great. <laughs> you know, 
I, I, I would ask everybody what their favorite episode is, but it's hard to choose a favorite uh, episode. But I'd love to know a memorable episode for you. Uh, and it could be for any reason, either uh, it was, you know, it was memorable for as in terms of your performance or the direct, you know, directing on it was was particularly unique, the writing of it, you cracked something that, that you hadn't cracked yet. I would just be curious to hear what your mem your most memorable episode is. Kate, I'll start with you. I would say, for me, the most memorable episode to kind of answer, I guess, all the things you were touching on would probably for me be episode five, just because that was one in particular that with the writers and like visually, we were always talking about a lot. And I think particularly that's one that, you know, because obviously we were shut down halfway through filming, like that's one in the shutdown because we, we went back and filmed that episode. So we spent a lot of time in our lockdown, like working on that app and thinking about it. But I'd say from a directing standpoint, that one was particularly amazing for me because I hadn't worked with effects like that before. So it was a real big, like, challenge for me to want to do that and also just working with the amazing cast we have because sort of like what Tom was talking about earlier like you know they're filming on a very small patch of grass and I have these beautiful concept um artists working for us who are doing like this amazing art of like Elias the monster but at the end of the day Elias isn't there <laughs> and I think watching Tom and all the other actors just really commit to this sort of very imaginative world we're building for me that was really inspiring creatively but also just yeah like I just feel like I learned so much doing that episode because it was just, that was the one I think that was just so far out of my comfort zone for what I'd done before. And yeah, and had reaped a lot of rewards for me, I guess, in terms of what I learned. So, yeah. Wonderful. Kevin, what about you? It's a, this is like choosing children. I, I mean, I would preface, like I am so proud of all of these episodes and what everybody did on it. And Kate, I heard you say once, it, it's like, it truly is a dream project in the sense of yeah. each episode felt like um, from script to delivery, like got to do its own unique genre or, or thing. And that, that's just exciting as a creative to get to be a part of that. And then to see everybody like deliver the way they did. And I could probably call out a moment in each episode as they were being shot that I was like, this is, this is pretty special. Like I think about even when we were doing, momentous and we were at the bottom yeah. of the quarry and it was just it, like just it felt big um and the, when we were doing the raid on rocks uh as everybody remembers it was freezing cold and there was giant rain machines and we were like it was, felt like a hurricane and that like it just the energy in that um felt awesome i i i do think the most memorable for me was the, the finale um when jonathan came on and I think that was a combination of we got to shoot it last and had just been through COVID with everybody and it was like so just a I think everybody was so um, excited and on board to get to this final moment with, with Loki, Sylvie and He Who Remains and it felt like it was a return to everything that everybody had done in that first episode of this is going to boil down to a couple of people sitting around a table talking but to get to do it at the end, it did, it felt, for me, and I'm sure, Kate, you felt the same, and everybody, like, it was, um, it felt like it was truly a finale, even when we were getting to, to make it, and it was just cool, like, Jonathan coming in for that week, and it felt like this, like, new final piece of energy to kind of throw mm -hmm. into the mix and, and bring us home. Michael, I'm coming to you next. What about you? <laughs> Um, well, yeah, look, I, I, it's, I, I have to echo and say they're all, they're all my babies and I, and I, lo and I love them all. And, and it is, it is a dream. I mean, I'm, I'm relatively young and, and, and I, and I, but I, I always think this is, this is it. This might be the peak creatively <laughs> and, and I'm okay. And I'm, and I'm like, I'm good with that. I'm, I'm like, that's, I'm, I'm like, that's good. If this is, if this is the thing I'm known for the rest of my life and career, like, holy crap, I'm so proud. Um, I love all the episodes. I like, I, I guess episode four is amazing for the way that everything detonates. But if I, if I had to pick the one that, that I feel maybe the most proud of, of all of them. It, it is the premiere. It's episode one. Mm -hmm. um, that scene that Tom just talked about is probably my favorite scene 
in the show when when Loki sees his own death. That was a that was a thing we we came up with on day one of the writers' room. Oh wow! We 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 ended the first day, and, and it, it was this revelation of episode one is going to end with Loki as Buzz Lightyear when Buzz Lightyear finds out that he's just a toy, and and that's going to be what launches our show forward. And and so it was cool to to build to that and and to see it rendered so beautifully. I, I think that episode one, you know, there's there's a lot of exposition that we had to chew through. And the team did such an amazing job rendering it with Miss Minutes. You know, Miss Minutes was just me writing the script, being like, all right, it's Mr. DNA, but she's a Southern clock. <laughs> like, like that's it. Now she's on my hat and she's <laughs> Kevin's shoulder. And like, that's, that's amazing. But the, I guess the thing, it's that long scene between Loki and Mobius um, in in the time theater that that is I'm, I'm forever shocked that marvel I, I remember i turned in the script and i was like there's a lot of talking and there's there's one scene in particular that's just a lot of dialogue like we can pull it back and instead the notes that came back from marvel were can it be longer can we can we have more of that and this and me being like oh wow like yeah we all want to make the same show and and that face-off between Loki and Mobius, which is just plays like great theater and certainly would never work if it weren't for Tom and Owen's incredible performances, Kate's awesome direction of them. Uh, they make the words look even better. <laughs> they make them look a lot better than they are. But I'm just so proud of, the, of that sequence and, and that first episode. Yeah, and it just goes to show you the power of the show. You know, Miss Minutes, you know, began as this little idea. Now it's on your hat. My favorite mug literally is this TVA mug that I, I, I drink my coffee from every day. And it's just, you know, it's all part of our lives now. You know, Tom, uh, as a performer, this show has to be so rewarding because you played this character for 10 years. But then this in these six hours, you take the character to all of these different places that we as audiences and as longtime fans never, ever thought would happen. And so, you know, I imagine every episode is memorable to you because it's unlocking another layer of Loki. Uh, but is there one that stands out the most? Gosh, I mean, it's, it's, um, I wonder if, uh, I wish there were two more of us so that every episode could get a, get yeah. a <laughs> um, for, for, for different reasons. And I, and I would, you know, I, I, I can, I want feel myself wanting to agree with, with, with Kay on five and Kevin on six and Michael on, on one. So it's very uh, difficult um, for all those reasons. I, I mean, f five I do remember was, a, was um, extraordinary because suddenly I was uh, the only person not wearing horns and green, a green cap. I was wearing a, a shirt and tie and I was surrounded by Richard E. Grant and Diobio Operai and Jack Beale and Sophia Di Martino in this assembly of blue cushions that was going to become Alligator Loki. Um, but with the least <laughs> sort of everyone else looking somehow more like Loki than I did. Um, six was extraordinary for, for the reasons that Kevin pointed out. It was the last week of filming at the end of a very long year and uh, it felt incredibly emotional. For that reason, it felt, it felt like truly the, the end, and um, memorable because we none of us knew what to do when we finally finished, and we stood around in a circle for 15 minutes um, with the greatest crew in the world applauding each other. Um, uh, was I very memorable for that reason, and I still find it very moving. One was, as Michael says, was the the cornerstone. Uh, of the whole idea and I knew as a performer that it had to work in order for the rest of it to work um, so yes they I want to s share the vote but I also probably should say um, I think three is really memorable for the conversation um, between Loki and Sylvie uh, on the train I think four is memorable because it's it's so taut um, I think perhaps just just for trying to be different and it's the sort of thing Loki would do. Um, two is memorable. I'm going to put my chips on two. 
um, because that feels like the beginning of a new story. And um, and it was some of the st- with some of the stuff in episode two we, we did very early on in our um, schedule and in the first week or something. Um, and it's really where Loki and Mobius become these unlikely um, co-detectives in, yeah. um, in a thriller. And we were, I think in the very, very first week of our schedule, we were filming some of those scenes in the TVA archives and in those, in, in the sort of wider bureaucracy of the, of the TVA. And it's also where Loki comes face to face with Sylvie for the first time. And I knew that this was the beginning of something in, in, in kind of everything that, that Owen Wilson and Sophia De Martino and Rumi Mosaku and Gugu and Bata Rule were doing. I was doing things as Loki because of, because of working with them that I had never done before. And, and so new flavors were coming out through this through this new these new dynamics and and because of their amazing strengths as performers and and kind of tennis partners i suppose um i remember the because that relationship with mobius is completely new i don't think loki's ever trusted anyone like that or been emotionally invested quite in anyone in that way um and um I remember in the very, it must have been us, I can't remember, you guys will remember, second or third day of filming, we're in the archives, Mopi, M- Mobius and Loki are trying to crack the case, and uh, Mobius has got hold of a clue, and um, the, the, an, another clue that basically there's, um, the variant they're looking for is hiding out in apocalypses between 2047 and 2052, and it's when, um, so all we have to do is cross-reference the production of Kablooey, this futuristic gum in, in, into the, I'm getting really into the weeds here. Um, <laughs> Loki didn't know what Kablooey was, and it's a snack. And, um, and uh, Owen improvised this thing like, um, you didn't have, what well, you didn't have snacks on Asgard? And I said, you know, grapes, nuts, and Owen said, no wonder you're so bitter. And off we go. And, and I think we, that was the second or third day of our, of our whole shoot. And I suddenly thought, Owen's in, Loki and Mobius are working. We've got this train on the tracks. This is going to be really fun. Um, so yeah, for, that, for those reasons. Working with, with the other cast, I think. Yeah, I'd love, I would love to touch on the other cast, too, because it's such a great cast. Marvel always does such a wonderful job at putting these ensembles together. Um, you know, Kate, uh, what was your sort of, uh, you know, bringing this whole cast together, what was that like, and, and what kind of unique challenges uh, or rewards did that present you as a director? Oh, I think, honestly, it was just like putting together a really big puzzle, right? Because we'd all, like, talk as a team as, like, you know, another character came into place. And like, I remember that casting uh, Sylvie was obviously a big challenge. And, you know, when we all saw Sophia's tape and obviously I'd know Sophia from past short films I'd made, but everybody else kind of saw in her what I felt could be really interesting as well for Sylvie. So that was really exciting to lock in. And, but there were also like so many surprises. Like I remember when Wumi auditioned for us and all of us were like, wow, she's amazing and giving us such a cool take on this character. And I think all of us were really inspired by that. So no, I think it's, it's honestly just really exciting kind of seeing it all fall into place really. But I, I guess the best way I can describe it is like putting together a giant puzzle and then hoping that the, it works and makes sense to people. <laughs> um, but yeah. Ke- Kevin and Michael, uh, any thoughts on sort of bringing this ensemble together and was, you know, when you started writing the show, was there somebody that you were like, we have to have this person in there? Oh, Michael, I'll let you start with <laughs> I mean, Tom, Tom Hiddleston, I, I think it was, just, I, it was just, I was just, I was realizing, I, I was just like, I, I think like the first draft of the first outline, it was just Tom in every, it was just realizing like, okay, Tom is in every scene of every, <laughs> like, like we're going to put so much on this guy's shoulders in this. And, and so it was the, 
uh, you know, Sylvie, I guess we, we always knew that that character was going to carry, you know, you know, pick, carry a lot of the show on the back half along with Tom. Um, it was Mobius who was kind of a discovery on the page, really what that character could be becoming Loki's first friend in, yeah. in a way. And, and that, that piece of casting was so pivotal, a, a energy that um, could play in opposition to Loki, but also could be a rascal alongside him. Uh, they're, they're so different, yet you understand exactly why they become pals. Uh, I mean, Owen, you know, that, that what, a, what a revelation he was. Uh, to get him as Mobius. We always, I remember joking in the room and like once the scripts were coming together, we were like, this Mobius role is, this is a gift for whoever gets it. <laughs> and then it's like, and Owen completely exceeded and blew away expectations of what that, that, that actually was. Yeah. Um, and I remember late in the game, Kate, the <laughs> Casey, um, oh, I yeah. think, every comedian that anyone knows and loves was probably auditioning for that. And, and yeah. Eugene maybe did like two readings, Eugene Cordero and both yeah. were like, and I don't know if it was because we were deep in prep at that point and just very tired. And Tom, I remember <laughs> you were in the office and it was like 10 yeah. o'clock at night, but you were there and like helping us. And, and we were watching these tapes of uh, Eugene just saying, what's a fish and, cracking up <laughs> like just it was making us laugh so much where it was like this is Casey this is it <laughs> you know uh, as we start to wrap up you know Tom we've had some distance from this show now and and you've been able to see sort of how the fans have embraced it um and how it's kind of found itself in in uh pop culture uh going on I think it's going to be a legend you know what has been a takeaway for you like what are you the most proud of in terms of uh seeing how this show has sort of been embraced by everyone around the world. I mean, I'm always genuinely humbled when I, because re I realize the character means so much to so many people for so many different reasons. And there's obviously, a, there's obviously something compelling about what he represents, what Loki represents in uh, the history of human thought, um, having been around for several thousand years. And I'm really just a kind of temporary torchbearer for the idea of Loki, I think. And um, I see it as a, as, a re as, a, as a responsibility, but it's also a gift to me because it's um, when I'm made aware of, of what the character means, um, and how closely people have kind of taken him into their hearts. I'm just very, I'm very grateful and I feel very humbled. Um, and all over the place, I bump into people. Um, it's very moving when you go to, you know, when, when you see children dressing up in Loki costumes or um, uh, you meet people and um, it's, you know, I met somebody the other day who said she'd become an actor because of, because of it and and it's it's um it's quite it's quite it, it takes me back I'm, i feel quite overwhelmed by it but it's very moving and um and also to see how uh, i think this show particularly and, and the exploration of loki's multiplicity um and the different corners of his identity um that haven't been explored they are now kind of incarnate in different costumes and recently i've seen a lot of uh, a lot of Loki love um, uh, at, uh, all over the place. And Richard E. Grant actually wrote me an email and said, you must have your hand on the crystal ball somehow. Because he remembers me saying, I think, you know, this, you're good, this is going to make an impact. And he sort of dismissed it as me trying to allay his uh, first day nerves. And his whole life is kind of, <laughs> he's like, oh, right, Loki's a thing. I understand. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's very, it's very moving. It's a very, it's a moving thing. And, um, one, I feel very privileged to be part of. 
you know, on that note, uh, you know, you must have done something right when you get a season two. So congratulations on that and good luck with that and working on that. And, and congratulations on the show itself on a personal note. I was a huge fan of the show and it was a great, I had a great time watching it over the summer. Uh, and, it's, and it's an experience that I, I will not uh, soon forget. Uh, so thank you so much. I would like to thank Michael Waldron, uh, Kevin Wright, Kate Heron, and of course, Tom Hiddleston. Good luck on season two, and thank you for a memorable job on season one of Loki. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.